This is Don Frederico of the podcast Higher Callings. What you're about to hear is an unedited version of an interview I did with Jennifer Haverkamp. Jennifer is the Graham Family Director of the Graham Sustainability Institute at the University of Michigan. She has had a long and distinguished career in environmental sustainability and, in particular, international diplomacy over worldwide environmental issues. Jennifer's accomplishments include leading U.S. negotiating teams during the Obama administration that successfully negotiated international agreements to reduce or limit climate change. This unedited version of the interview includes Jennifer's description of her years as a student and early career leading up to her many years of government service. A shorter, produced version of the podcast that begins with her first government position can be found at Higher Callings. I'm with Jennifer Haverkamp. Uh, Jennifer, it's good to see you. Welcome to Higher Callings. Thanks so much, Don, for inviting me to be on your program. And I think for the benefit of our listeners, we should just mention that you and I have known each other for quite a few years. We both attended the College of Worcester as undergraduates. And we both serve on the board of trustees of the college, and we have for quite a number of years. In fact, I was uh, thinking about it today that we also have chaired the same committees on at the College of Worcester. So we've kind of followed in each other's footsteps in that capacity. And, and uh, it's been great uh, to work with you and to see you uh, as a leader on the board of trustees and, and watch the amazing work you've done there. Thanks so much. It's uh, it's fun to be joining you for this next venture of yours. Thank you. So um, you have had quite a career uh, spanning a few decades now, not to give away your age, but you are younger than me, so I think I can do that. And um, you, uh, your work has, you've just had a tremendous commitment and done really uh, quite a lot of terrific work in the area of environmental sustainability over a long period of time, and including some really exciting positions you've held over the last few years. I thought what we might do is introduce you to our listeners in what you're doing now, and um, maybe some of your most recent really exciting experiences, and then start over and kind of go from the beginning and follow your career path and then after that, maybe talk a little bit about some of the current issues on climate change and environmental sustainability and the insights uh, you might have in those areas, given the important work you've done uh, in those areas. So right now, uh, you are at the University of Michigan, and you've been there for a couple of years now. Can you talk a little bit about what your, what your job is, what your position is at the University of Michigan, and, and some of the exciting work that you're involved in there? Sure, my pleasure. Um, I've been with the University of Michigan now for about two and a half years. I serve in my primary position as the Graham Family Director of the Graham Sustainability Institute. And that institute is what's considered a boundary spanning organization. Our job is to help make the connections between faculty and our students and external organizations, stakeholders, so that the faculty research has real impact um, with organizations who need the answers to those questions. Uh, We are uh, located in the office of the provost so that we very clearly work with all the different schools and colleges across the university. And we specialize, I would say, in helping bridge across the silos of different disciplines. So we fund research for faculty um, to come together as teams from different schools and colleges. We develop leaders, student leaders in sustainability through a few programs that bring them together to learn how to work together in interdisciplinary teams, again, with a client organization on the outside. I also teach at Michigan Law School. A seminar on international trade and sustainability is what I've been teaching. I'll teach international trade law next year. Um, I have an appointment at the Ford School of Public Policy, and I've just recently stepped down from spending two years as the co-chair of a commission 
set up by the University of Michigan president to develop recommendations on how the university could achieve carbon neutrality. In other words, a pathway, a timeline, a set of recommendations for how the university could reduce its carbon footprint to net zero and by when. And um, it's uh, we came out with a very robust set of recommendations and I'm just really excited because today, just a few hours ago, uh, the university president, President Schlissel, announced his first round of actions that he's taking in response to our recommendations. And it's a great start. Jennifer, before uh, you went to Michigan, I know you spent a semester, I believe, at my other alma mater, Cornell Law School, uh, where you also taught. What, what were you doing at Cornell and how was that experience? Oh, I had a wonderful time at Cornell. Um, even though I went in the wrong semester, I went in the winter instead of the fall. Um, but but the people were great. I had a wonderful time teaching a seminar on international environmental law, current issues um, at the law school. And I was an executive in residence at the Atkinson Center um, for a sustainable future, where Basically, I was a resource for students and faculty interested in better understanding how to engage effectively with policymakers. Um, I convened some faculty sessions around some current topics in international environmental law. And I got to live in an apartment in the Peace Tower over the law school. So I, I just had a charmed existence. That's great. I can tell you, too, and I may have told you this before, that I know the person who was dean of the law school when you were there. And uh, I know he was very sorry when you left. Um, yeah. You were obviously very highly thought of uh, at the law school. That's very kind. Before that, uh, speaking of international environmental law, you held a very interesting position within the Obama administration at the secretary at the Department of State. Um, I want to talk in some depth about that later on in the interview, but can you at least uh, for now just maybe give a high-level introduction to the work you are doing, the very important work you are doing at the State Department? Sure. I um, had the, the great privilege to join the State Department as a special representative for environment and water resources, and uh, that from that position, I led some of the international climate negotiations uh, that the Obama administration concluded. Um, one of them regarding uh, greenhouse gas related to uh, the pollution of the ozone layer and another one related to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from global civil aviation. And I also was uh, in charge of the team that does the international diplomacy around water resources and water conflict. That's great. Thank you. And and um, that just had to be such an amazing experience, but we're going to come back to that. What, what I'd like to do is kind of go back to the beginning and, and ask you, when in your lifetime did you first begin thinking about a, a career or other work in environmental policy? Well, since you asked, it goes way, way back. Um, when I was a small child, I grew up on uh, the campus of Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana, which is on a bluff overlooking the Ohio River. And the woods between our house and the river um, were my playground. And I just became really, really uh, fond and interested in natural history. And um, at the same time, that same beautiful vista of the Ohio River had looming over it one of the largest coal fire power plants along the Ohio River Valley, the Clifty Creek plant. And so I had that juxtaposition of uh, pollution and uh, uh, conservation right in front of me from, from when I was very young. Were you doing anything before you went to college to further your interest in environmental uh, sustainability or environmental policy? Well, it would probably age me too much if I told you that I was out there collecting cans on the first Earth Day, so I won't tell you that. Well, I, I will say I was doing something very much like that, and I think I was in <laughs> high school at the time, and you hadn't reached high school at the time. That was 1970. That was the year of the Clean Air Act, wasn't it? Yes, it was. 
Yep, original right. enactment. The original um, enact. mm -hmm. So um, how, then you went on to the College of Worcester, as we've talked about before. How did your experience at Worcester help prepare you for the car career that you probably couldn't yet have predicted the kind of career you were going to have? But how did Worcester maybe plant some of the seeds and set the stage for what would come later in your life. Sure. And I think very few college students, and especially entering college students, can envision what their career path is going to be. And even if they think they have a clear vision, so often they discover they've taken detours or complete forks in the road that they didn't envision. But for me, um, I pretty quickly uh, settled on a major in biology, which was a continuation of my strong personal interests. Um, but, but I think part of, so in addition to Worcester just giving me a great liberal arts education, um, it also I think helped me realize that I didn't want the kind of career that I thought was the most likely path, which was being a small college liberal arts academic teaching biology for the rest of my life, like the professors I looked up to. But, but instead, I think, uh, especially when I had the opportunity to go on to graduate school, it was a chance to um, move beyond the sciences more into the social sciences where I thought I could apply my scientific training to uh, policy issues that I was increasingly caring and worrying about. Were you active at all in any environmental work while you were at the college? You know, I'm not even sure Worcester had an environmental club at that time. Um, I was active in a lot of extracurricular activities, but, but nothing that you would call the environmental group. And I think if I remember correctly, you actually graduated first in your class at Worcester. Am I right? That's true. And you gave a, you gave a speech because you were valedictorian, but later, and I might go into this towards the end of this interview, you went back many years later and gave the commencement address at the college a few years ago. It was a do-over. Um, you don't often get to do do-over. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> um, and then you also, um, your next move after college was also a rare opportunity uh, that very few people get. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Oxford? Sure. Um, so, Basically, as I was approaching graduation, I didn't know what I wanted to do next um, and thought I should find some way of spending a few years either in some job or in an international study experience that would would help provide some clarity or at least some growth um, in other parts of my other dimensions of my education. And. And. I don't know if it's on a whim or on the encouragement of faculty, but I ended up, I discovered um, to my surprise, fall of my senior year, that the Rhodes Scholarships had opened up to women a couple years before. And so I put in an application and uh, was very fortunate to be awarded a Rhodes. And with that comes the opportunity to spend two or three years studying at Oxford University. And so I did that after Worcester, and um, I I did a degree there in politics and philosophy. I think by that point, it was pretty clear to me I didn't want to be a full-time scientist, and so this was the way to expand into the social sciences more, um, more actively and just really stretch in completely new directions. Um, it probably drove my philosophy professors crazy that they were, you know, having us read these philosophers who were trying to divine just mentally, you know, the characteristics of, a, of, of an object. And I was bringing my scientific principles to it and saying, well, just, just experiment on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, I, I remember you telling me once that when you were in college, you were thinking, of maybe going on to graduate school in German, I believe. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, in addition to environmental, another dimension of your work, especially in recent years, has been international. And I'm wondering if your interest in studying German or anything that you experienced while you were overseas at Oxford may have helped develop your interest in 
international matters? Well, I think that how I got interested in German is one of those examples of you never know where something might take you. Because um, as a biology major with many required courses in biology and chemistry, I didn't know how I was going to squeeze in that three credit requirement for a foreign language. And the most efficient way to do it was one quarter in Germany with the Goethe Institute, and then I'd be done. And so I went to Germany my sophomore year, and I just fell in love with learning another spoken language and uh, came back and took several more courses in it. And um, then obviously living in Oxford, I had the opportunity with these ridiculously long vacations you have between each term to travel a lot through Western Europe and meet friends from all over the world. Uh, so I think, you know, I had some pretty formative experiences with, with seeing that um, uh, there was just a whole lot beyond the United States that was fascinating. Um, probably the peak of my German experience was uh, a group of students put on the play Urfaust um, in German. And I played a drunken male student in one of the scenes. And afterwards, a native speaking German said to my friend, the director, that, that, that one, where did he learn his German? <laughs> so you obviously did a great job, but I would say they, they might not have done a good job of type casting if they were trying to. I was a better actor than German speaker, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and probably acted as a drunk, since hmm. I don't ever picture you as a drunk. Um, there you go. From Oxford, you then um, came back to the U.S. and you went to the Conservation Foundation. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I was um, pretty sure when I returned from Oxford that I wanted to launch into a career in environmental policy. And so uh, job search as a young graduate, I decided to try the Bay Area and the Washington DC area because both had lots of environmental organizations. Um, interviewed both places, ended up with actually two job offers, um, chose the one with the Conservation Foundation in Washington, where it just seemed like, you know, they're more of a think tank. They they weren't, uh, they were approaching things from a much more sort of academic and rigorous way, which at the time I was more comfortable with than wearing the hat of an advocate. Um, but it's kind of funny because the organization that I didn't take a job with back in San Francisco was the Environmental Defense Fund where much later in my career, I ended up working for seven years. So you ended up going to both places eventually. What yes. kind of work did you do at the Conservation Foundation? Uh, I worked on Conservation Foundation. A lot of what they did was uh, produce reports and books and uh, their main targets were policymakers, members of Congress. Um, I worked on a book on energy conservation. Uh, I did some papers with others on Western water policy. Uh, we were doing what we called the State of the Environment Report. Um, and then I co-authored a book on uh, soil erosion and how it's a source of uh, non-point source water pollution. We haven't talked about time frames. What years were you, why don't we start in Oxford and then what years were you in the at the Conservation Foundation? So I was in Oxford from 1979 to 1981 and at Conservation Foundation until 19, through uh, summer of 1984. And then I believe you went to law school, right? I did. All right, so why does somebody who's interested in environmental policy go to law school? Or why did you, anyway? <laughs> I was trying to follow you, Don. No, <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't know it yet. You leapfrogged um, over me, Jennifer. <laughs> um, go ahead, What what were you thinking? Well, I think basically um, the degree that I came out of Oxford with was a master's degree, um, but it was not a professional degree and um, or a terminal degree. And I think that I had a sense that for the kind of careers I was interested in, the level of ambition I had to, to rise in my field, that a terminal degree was appropriate. And so 
Um, I'm one of those people who basically backed into going to law school. I thought about uh, several other degrees, but law seemed to have the most uh, the most practical flexibility. I could I could have a, a real skill and also use what I learned in a lot of other in other fields. And there's a lot of nexus between law and policy. And at the time, uh, and I still recommend this to to young people wondering about careers in environmental law or policy or advocacy, uh, to to specialize in something rather than get a general degree in environmental studies. You went to law school at Yale. Mm-hmm. Um, did they offer environmental law courses at the time you were there in the mid eighties? They did. They did. Um, and I took some of them. Um, and, but Yale was not known as sort of the best environmental law, law school, but they had, through the classes and through the extracurricular activities there were, and the summer jobs and internships and things you could do, there are plenty of ways to, to develop some specialization along the way. And I imagine one of those ways was what you did your fall semester of third year, right? Yeah. Um, Yale was, uh, one reason that Yale was a very attractive place, a attractive place to me to go to law school was because I had already uh, worked for three years. I'd had a graduate degree. So I was looking for a law school that would treat you as a grown up. And um, they gave us a lot of flexibility in how we structured our training. And uh, one thing that I was able to do was spend the fall of my third year of law school for credit with an internship with the Natural Resources Defense Council in San Francisco. And what did you do while you were there? What kind of work did the Natural Resources Defense Council do? Well, they're they're one of the largest uh, U.S. environmental advocacy organizations, so they do all sorts of things. I was working for a couple of the attorneys, um, you know, basically sort of as a legal intern on the work that they needed doing. But um, one was... Th- one was involved more in sort of natural resources conservation. The other one was an energy conservation specialist. Uh, one of the things that I got to do was write and deliver testimony at a hearing um, involving the oil rigs off the coast of Santa Barbara um, and did that for them. You know, it's probably worth mentioning that in the mid 80s, Environmental law was probably out of its infancy, but it was still a fairly new discipline. Um, And um, some of these organizations, I don't know when NRDC was founded, but they were still relatively new and and learning the ropes of how to go about with environmental advocacy, I think, in that time. I'm sure a lot of it developed in the 1970s, but it was still pretty new in the 80s when you were there. Um, after law school, you went on and clerked for a judge in the Ninth Circuit, Judge Betty Fletcher, correct? That's right. Um, and that was, you know, I remember at the time thinking, it's only downhill from here because I have the best job with the best office in the best city. Um, I just love Was she in San Francisco? Contact. Was she no, in San Francisco? Seattle. Oh, Seattle. that's right. Okay. Seattle in a courthouse looking out over Puget Sound and um, Judge Fletcher is just was just the most amazing uh, mentor and role model. Um, I don't know if you know much about Judge Fletcher, but uh, she was the second woman judge appointed to the Ninth Circuit by Jimmy Carter. Uh, Just an incredible uh, progressive judge who went senior um, only as a requirement by the Senate to make room for her son to come on the court as an appellate uh, judge as well um, under an anti-nepotism statute. But instead of going quiet, she continued to uh, hear a full caseload, had all her law clerks um, continued full time until the week before she died at the age of 89. Mm. That sounds like a wonderful experience. Uh, did she share your interest in environmental law and environmental policy? She did. She did. In fact, that was one of the reasons I applied to work for her. Okay. Um, and then after the, it was a one-year clerkship, is that right? That's right. And then after that, I, I understand you went to 
the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. Um, what were you doing at the Justice Department and what years were you there? Sure. Um, yeah, I went to Washington with the Justice Department arriving, I guess, near the end of 1988 um, and went into the Environment Division, which was then called the Land and Natural Resources Division, um, and went into this very interesting little office that did a mix of policy, legislation, and special litigation work. And I did a variety of things in my three years there, but, but what I especially wonderfully stumbled into was I got there just as after many years of deadlock, the incoming President Bush and Congress had decided that they were finally ready to work together on reauthorizing the Clean Air Act. The 1970 Clean Air Act you and I were talking about earlier. Right. And, and this was uh, George H.W. Bush. Yes, it was George H.W. Bush. And so um, I got to be part of the team at EPA and the Justice Department that was drafting the president's legislation. And uh, I ended up kind of leading for that team the process of the revisions to the permitting and enforcement chapters. Um, and coordinating a lot of DOJ involvement in other parts of, of the bill and uh, spending a lot of time in congressional offices. And uh, it was just a, a really incredible experience because, especially because at the end of it, we actually passed, got the law passed. There are so many times in an advocacy career where you can throw yourself at something for years and it doesn't happen. You know, something doesn't happen. You have to pick yourself up and try again. And on this one, I, I managed to come near the end of lots of people trying and trying, and we, we made it happen, which was great. You were the right person in the right place at the right time. At least the latter two. <laughs> um, and how long were you at the Justice Department, Jennifer? Three years. Okay. What did you, well, let me ask you this. I mean, this was, you, you clerked for a federal judge, so you were in the judicial branch for one year. And then um, you went to work at the Justice Department. So now you were in the executive branch. I mean, were you developing at the time an interest in government work beyond just the matters you were working on at the moment? I would say yes. Um, you know, when I first was uh, out of law school, I figured that I would probably end up in a career in environmental advocacy. and. I think when I got to the Justice Department and saw just the incredible talent and commitment of my colleagues and the opportunities you had within government to make such a difference and get responsibility so early, um, it was um, just a really intellectually and uh, mission-wise gratifying place to be working. and. Um, I don't think at the time I assumed it would be my entire career, but but I was surrounded by people who had chosen to make it their entire career and were, you know, doing great work. And then you left the, the Justice Department, but you stayed in government. Uh, tell us about your next move after justice. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I went from justice to the Environmental Protection Agency, um, where I was a special assistant to one of the political appointees who headed the um, Office of Enforcement and Compliance at EPA. So I kind of went from the litigator agency to the client agency, but still um, looking at how cases get brought forward, how they ask justice to litigate them, all the cases that they handle through the administrative law process instead, um, and worked on a variety of projects at EPA. But that I was only there for a year before with the change of administration, with the Clinton administration coming in, um, I had, again, another one of these sort of unexpected opportunities to pivot in a new direction. And, yeah, tell uh, us about that. I, I, You've told me this before, and I, it, I find it fascinating how that opportunity came about and how it really helped to shape your future to a large extent. Tell us what happened. Sure. Yeah, I had no idea that I was making such a major turn in the road, but um, so when I was, um, when I was at EPA in, uh, 1992, 
Um, the US government with Canada and Mexico were negotiating the North American Free Trade Agreement and environmental and labor issues had risen to become a very important part of those negotiations. A lot of the concern by people opposing the NAFTA were what effect it might have on the environment. Um, and at the same time, there was a there was a dispute between the US and Mexico over um, a US law that said that you could not export uh, tuna to the United States if it was caught in a way that harmed dolphins. And you know, all the little dolphin safe tuna labels when you buy canned tuna. Um, well, that turned out to be uh, um, illegal under the current international trade laws that you were supposed to treat a can of tuna at the border the same, however it was caught. So this basically, those two things led to this clash between the trade world and the environment world. They discovered each other and they didn't like what they saw. So, so USTR, the Office of the US Trade Representative, which is the part of the white, the executive office of the president that leads international trade negotiations, had to suddenly get smart on environmental issues. And they had borrowed a friend of mine from the Justice Department to help set that office up and work on those issues. And she had to go back to DOJ. And so she came to me and said, would you be interested in coming to USTR on loan from EPA? And I knew nothing about international trade. Um, I, all my career up until that point had been pretty much entirely US domestic law. Um, but it just sounded like an intriguing new challenge and uh, worth figuring it out. And I was you know, going on loans, so that was not terribly high stakes. And uh, EPA signed the papers and sent me off to USTR. How long were you there, Jennifer? Uh, 10 years. <laughs> wow. So what were the positions you held there? What kind? I mean, it's it really is interesting. You know, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Right. Mm -hmm. And your life mm -hmm. really happened at the U.S. Trade Representative Office. Um, what uh, what kinds of matters did you work on? What positions did you hold? Tell us a little bit about that important work. Sure. And again, it was a little bit like walking in the door at the right time. Um, when I got to USTR, it was the beginning of the Clinton administration and President Clinton had committed to negotiate side agreements on labor and environment uh, to improve, to address the concerns of the opponents of NAFTA in those areas. And so I got put on one of the negotiating teams um, and actually both. Um, so I was involved in negotiating the labor and the environmental side agreements with Canada and Mexico. Um, and then the whole process of taking NAFTA through congressional approval. Um, and so that's probably where the international bug first really bit me. Um, and uh, working with folks in other countries to, you know, and, and just the whole process of negotiation of figuring out what other the interests of the the most important interests of those on the other side of the table were and how you craft texts that that address both concerns and, you know, figure out what they really need and what they're just bluffing about in order to trade. It's it just fascinating. So, I so did you, that. you were learning a skill that I guess is multi multilateral diplomacy. Right. But one right. that had an environmental focus because that was your background. Exactly, exactly. And then um, I, I, um, USTR invited me to uh, stay, in other words, take a job there and not go back to EPA. And so I um, was uh, hired to be the uh, deputy in that office, the new office they had created for environment and natural resources. And um, I would just come back from maternity leave with my first child. I thought this sounds like a great job. Two months after I got there, uh, the head of the office was moved over to become the head of the Europe office. And I was asked to become the head of the environment office, um, which was, uh, I was a little reluctant to do, but, um, 
again, it seemed like a really great opportunity. And that's the job that I then had for the next um, eight and a half years. And um, in that job, we kind of covered the, we negotiated the environmental provisions that were being put into bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. We also um, were involved in the negotiation of trade related provisions in international environmental agreements. Um, one in particular that people might relate to was an agreement about international trade in living genetically modified organisms. So it was not a trade agreement, but it was so about trade. Um, and then we also worked on uh, all the disputes with other countries where the trade dispute had something to do with an environmental or natural resource um, policy or law that a country had. You know, it sounds like very exciting work. And were you traveling a lot in this position? I was. Um, it was. It was a. It was a very demanding time. Um, and the USTR is another place where I think you know people are really dedicated. They work really hard. Um, I was in a policy office, so I'd moved away from being, you know, serving as the lawyer, but the general counsel's office, um, they worked them so hard that there was an expression I heard there once of at USTR's general counsel's office, they burn the furniture. In other words, they work people so hard, they're destroying their assets, which. <laughs> That's a great, great turn of phrase. Um, yeah. Not it, sounds like a, it sounds like working for a, big law firm when right. you're a young associate or something. Yeah. But you've got incredible, incredible work. Yeah. Um, and no, so it was, it was always interesting, but it was a lot of travel. Um, and, uh, but it's also um, just such a great place in which to see how policy is made and be part of making policy because USTR, similar to the state department, coordinates these policies across lots of agencies. So we were running processes where we had to hammer out uh, disagreements across federal agencies in order to determine our negotiating position to then take internationally. Now, um, I think you left there in 2003. I mean, I, I assume that in that office, just like many federal agencies, the personnel change when there's a change in administrations, especially if there's a change in the parties that are in power and in politics. So you were there throughout most of the Clinton administration, um, maybe the whole Clinton administration. Clinton administration. And, then, and then a little bit into the next Bush administration. Um, and did you leave because it, it was a changeover of administrations or was there something else that drove you to leave at that time? Actually, I think thought that I might be leaving um, with the changeover in administration, thinking there would not be a similar commitment to addressing the environmental dimensions in trade. But but the U.S. trade representative that Bush uh, appointed, Robert Zellick, um, was actually very committed to these issues. And so at least from the USTR perspective, there was a real continuity of policy and the other reason I stayed for two years was once the Republicans were in control of the executive branch, Republicans in Congress were willing to give them something called trade promotion authority to negotiate new international trade agreements, which uh, they had not given to Clinton. And so I spent the next two years negotiating the environmental chapters of the U.S. Singapore and U.S. Chile bilateral free trade agreements, um, which was, you know, a great fun. And then, and then I was ready to leave because going forward, there were going to be a lot more bilateral agreements, which we'd kind of set the template, and so there would be not. It'd be sort of something I'd already done. Um, and I had two small children, and I'd been traveling a lot at USTR, and I was ready for a break. So you described some of this work as great fun. And I, I really want to probe into that a little bit. What did you like about it so much? I mean, it sounds, you know, it sounds highly technical. It sounds um, very political in some ways, although I maybe not in 
the way we often use the word political. But what did you enjoy about it? It sounds like you had a real passion for doing this kind of bilateral and multilateral international negotiation on trade. Um, where does that passion come from and, and what did you like? Well, I think the you know, again, for me, the passion was that it was the environmental issues in trade, right? So I think I could have had a similarly passionate career if I'd been at the State Department the whole time. Um, but I think what, in part, what made it so interesting was we were, we were, if you will, cutting edge on trade and environment policy in the 1990s and early 2000s was when this was all being sorted out. And so every day was interesting, even though it was often also very contentious. Um, and so it really, really uh, honed and drew on my diplomatic skills within my own office, within my own federal government, much less once you got to the table with the other countries. Um, and, you know, the, I would say the engagement with people in other countries and understanding how very different their perspectives could be on some of these same issues was interesting. The idea that by bringing environmental issues into the trade negotiations, the countries we're dealing with on the other side, they're, the people who always negotiated their trade agreements realized they had to talk to their environmental agency counterparts. And so you were seeing a greater, um, coherence in policymaking in the other countries from by virtue of of having to address these issues with us. Um, and so that all made it interesting. Um, the international travel, people who don't do it glamorize it. Um, but we used to joke that the only way you know you're in Paris is if there's a croissant on your breakfast plate, because then, <laughs> then you go into a room with no windows and sit and negotiate until midnight. Yeah. Um, and you could be anywhere. So. Well, other than the croissant, I'm not sure that last part of your answer made it sound like much fun. Well, but that's it. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> it's hard work. It wasn't glamorous. It's really hard work. And I, I'm curious, um, at least at the time you were there, what was the United States standing in the world on environmental issues in trade negotiations? Were we viewed as a leader? Were we you know, what was the perception of, of the United States in that particular space at that time? In that space, I would say we were viewed by the advocacy community and those who were pushing environmental agendas as largely a leader. Um, for a lot of the other countries, the people across the table were mostly traditional trade agency people who were not happy to be having to address these issues. And a lot of what was driving the U.S. leadership was our domestic politics, where instead of a strong bipartisan support in Congress for trade liberalization, you had increasing concern about the impact of trade on the environment, on labor. And so the U.S. pretty much was driven to address these concerns in our international agreements to have any hope of getting Congress to approve them when we brought them back home. And I don't know this area at all. So I don't know if this is a good question or a dumb question, but um, it does strike me that one of the big challenges anytime you're doing international negotiations involving environmental issues is that the interests of the developed world are different from the issues um, and interests of the non-developed world uh, or underdeveloped world. Um, how much did that play a part in the work you were doing while you were at the office of the U.S. Trade Representative? It was very, very much a dimension of, of our work. and. Uh, an important aspect of that was if we were going to build into these agreements any obligations that those countries effectively enforce their environmental laws, that they maintain strong environmental laws, we also had to be willing to come forward with capacity building support um, that would help them 
if they did not have an adequate system in place, uh, move in that direction. Um, and so often the trade agreements we were negotiating were accompanied by a, an environmental cooperation agreement that either EPA or the State Department led the implementation of. So there was there was actually quite a bit of environmental diplomacy that accompanied the trade agreements. Um, so I think that was that was a general positive. I would say where people were willing to be critical was that it was the trade agenda that was prioritizing which countries were getting the support on environmental capacity building, rather than necessarily stepping back and saying which countries for biodiversity reasons or human suffering reasons ought to be our first priorities in this area. How much of an impact did the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative have while you were there on on environmental sustainability through trade? I like to think quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not something we hear about a lot, right? The, the general public doesn't hear a whole lot about um, the environmental policy issues that are being negotiated in trade talks. I, I think the general public probably doesn't have much of a window into what that entails. And can you give some examples of some of the things that you feel you and your group accomplished while you were there? So I don't know how deep you want to go into this. Probably um, not too deep. but <laughs> <laughs> So I think there are two ways to view this. One is... Um, through the lens of how are you using the the opportunity of a trade negotiation to help move another country toward a stronger environmental regime um, and one of the one of the probably examples that environmentalists like to point to actually happened after I left but the US Peru free trade agreement um, included actually at the insistence of Democrats in Congress, a very strong annex around forest protection that that ended up being what caused Peru to create its first environmental agency. Um, the where I would say we also had more impact than than would maybe again be obvious to the general observer is in developing the rules, including through uh, the disputes, to move the trading system to be much more understanding of and accommodating of a country's environmental regulatory measures um, that restrict a trade, but for environmental reasons. So, you know, navigating through that world so that um, trade was not a stifling of good environmental policy. Great. Thank you. So um, you left the office in 2003. And then what did you do after you left? So there were about four years there when I did a combination of things. I was uh, adjunct teaching part-time at Johns Hopkins Graduate School. I was doing a little bit of consulting. I was on an international team that did a 10-year review of the NAFTA environmental agreement that I'd negotiated 10 years before. Um, but also, I was spending a lot of time parenting and uh, focusing on my kids until uh, 2007. And uh, what did you do then? Um, this is kind of funny, but again, people keep returning and popping back up in your life. Um, the same friend who, uh, had the position at USTR, who went back to the justice department was at environmental defense fund and, um, was going out on maternity leave and they were looking for someone to lead their, their team to the international climate negotiations. What, what is the Environmental Defense Fund? The Environmental Defense Fund is um, a large, sophisticated U.S. nonprofit or uh, non-governmental organization. It has offices around the U.S. and in several other countries. It um, 
prides itself on finding the ways that work, that um, they bring economics as well as science and law together to solve problems. And they're a very, very effective advocacy organization. And so is this your first uh, involvement in climate change work? It is. Um, in fact, before I took that position, I knew that climate change was really, really important. And I was so glad that other people were working on it. Um, and then <laughs> I, <laughs> I went to EDF and uh, uh, they had an international climate program. And I, I uh, became the head of that group leading the, the work to the UN climate negotiations in particular. Um, but that expanded out to a fair number of bilateral bilateral initiatives that EDF was also pursuing at the time. Okay. And then after a number of years at EDF, you went back into government at the State Department. We, we talked about that briefly at the beginning of the interview. Um, but can you, you know, tell us how that came about, what, uh, what you were brought in to do, um, and then what matters did you work on while you were at the State Department? Sure. So basically, um, when, um, when President Obama was reelected and I saw, you know, a strong commitment to environment and climate, um, I thought, well, my kids are getting older. I can maybe go back into one of these incredibly demanding jobs in government again. And so I started putting out some feelers and, um, had the uh, honor of being invited to uh, go to the State Department. Um, it's uh, a saga I won't get into, but I was actually nominated to a Senate confirmed position um, at a point in the process where uh, very, very few, I would say no environmental appointments were getting approved by the Republican controlled Senate anymore. Um, and so the State Department uh, created the position of special representative for environment and water resources and brought me in. Um, what and, were they working on at the time that they wanted to get you involved in? Well, there were there were there were more international environmental and climate negotiations than there were people to lead them, frankly, um, and especially people with multilateral negotiating experience, which I had from my years at USTR. Right. And so there was, you know, what you hear about the most, which is the Paris Climate Agreement, um, which had just, was just being concluded in 2015. But then there were two other- uh, And now wait, so in 2015, when did you go to the State Department? Was it at, right after that had been concluded? Right then, yeah. Okay. So beginning of 2016, um, and the um, but there were two other negotiations that were also uh, on track, if possible, to be completed in 2016, and so I led those two negotiating teams. What were those uh, agreements? So one is uh, ended up being called the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol is the international environmental agreement dedicated to protecting, to eliminating the hole in the ozone layer um, by international agreement to phase out the use of the chemicals that cause the hole in the ozone layer. And um, there's a chemical called hydrofluorocarbons, a class of chemicals called hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs, which are not a very not very ozone depleting. So they're a good substitute for the other ozone depleting chemicals. And they used in air conditioning, is that, or refrigeration? Yeah, they're used in air conditioning and refrigeration in particular. They have some other purposes too, like making foam and meter dose inhalers for asthma sufferers. Um, but they turn out to be an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. And so extremely important to agree to a phase down of use of HFCs, because if you didn't, the world was getting warmer, the world was rightly getting richer, 
And so there is more and more need for air conditioning, more and more need for refrigeration of processed food. Um, and if we didn't switch to substitutes to HFCs, um, it was really going to exacerbate climate change. And so, H H so do I understand this right? HFCs came in to help as a substitute for what had been used because it was better for the ozone layer. Exactly. But now that people were starting to focus on climate change, they realized that HFCs were much worse for climate change. Exactly. And so you were working on the uh, negotiations to try to phase those substances out in order to reduce the impact on climate. Right. And not to not to go on a big detour, but it made for a very complicated negotiation because the Montreal Protocol was not a climate forum. It was not a climate agreement. It was an ozone agreement. It was an ozone agreement. And so there was a big culture shift and, and also the pressure of all the politics of climate coming over into this other forum. But we reached agreement to phase down HFCs significantly. Um, analysts uh, have calculated that the agreement as implemented will avoid up to half a degree of global warming this century. Celsius, so, right? Yeah. For so, those who are really keeping track of what's exactly, Celsius and exactly. what's Fahrenheit, yeah. just in case somebody yeah. is doing yeah. those calculations. So just right there, I mean, an incredible professional rush to be able to say, I played a little part in helping to avoid half a degree of global warming. That's wonderful. And it sounds like it was more than a little part. You were leading a negotiation team. Mm -hmm. And then, and then uh, I know you're very modest. And I, just to go off track for a second, you've done amazing things throughout your career. I've known you for a number of years through our board work together. I never hear you talk about this. You don't brag. You don't. You're very unassuming, and that's why it's such a pleasure to bring these things out in your interview. Um, well, so very kind. I guess I'm just very much a Midwesterner. <laughs> you are, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, <laughs> And then there was the aviation agreement. Now, I've always understood that planes, jets are one of the biggest contributors to climate change and greenhouse gases. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you were doing with this aviation agreement. That was really interesting. So bear with me a moment. Um, the the UN climate agreement that everybody hears about, the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Agreement, those are where countries take responsibility for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in their own territory. So where else do greenhouse gas emissions happen? International aviation for planes flying back and forth between territories and international shipping. And so those two uh, sectors, shipping and aviation, basically fell outside of the UN climate agreements. And so what we were doing was in the UN organization responsible for global civil aviation, it's called ICAO, and it's based in Montreal, uh, long story of pressure to finally get ICAO countries to agree to negotiate a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from civil aviation. And as you said, they're huge emitters. The main source of their emissions are the fuel that they burn. And so it's pretty hard to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from an airplane. I mean, they've made planes a lot lighter. They put those little wing tips on the edge of the wings so that they they fly more efficiently. Um, but the main tools that aviation has to reduce their emissions are to come up with more efficient engines, to switch to sustainable biofuels, um, to improve air traffic control so that they spend less time circling airports. Um, but there's really not much else. And, and, and those are not gonna get you to carbon neutrality. Maybe eventually the biofuels will, but there are a lot of issues to be solved there. So the agreement that we negotiated was a commitment to limit emissions from civil aviation, international civil aviation to their 2020 levels. And for anything above 2020 levels going forward, countries would have to purchase 
uh, high quality offsets from some other greenhouse gas reduction in some other sector. And there are a lot of details I won't bore you with in terms of gradually ratcheting that down and um, the complexities of that negotiation. But, um, but again, it was sort of interesting for, it was interesting for the broad support of the aviation industry because I think they recognize that uh, millennial and Gen X customers are potential flyers care about their climate effect. And so aviation had to have an answer to what is it doing about uh, climate change. That's terrific. And so were you successful in those negotiations while you were at state? We were, we were. Um, it was uh, it was actually the one that people thought was a pretty long shot um, and was a real challenge. But in fact, we completed the aviation agreement uh, the end of September 2016. I flew to Kigali, Rwanda for the last negotiating session of the Montreal Protocol, and we completed that one. So, you know, probably the two most significant things I've done both concluded two weeks apart. That's so. amazing. The most significant thing you've done so far. So far. So far. <laughs> and and you also didn't you have some responsibility for implementation of Paris as well or or for getting more countries to sign on to Paris I was after it had that, been negotiated? I was part of that overall effort. Um definitely and and much of the negotiation in twenty sixteen isn't just in these big international meetings, but you have to travel to um your counterparts for bilateral negotiations with the countries who are the biggest sticking points or who are going to bring along the most other countries with them. And so we would go on teams to India, to China um, in particular, but other countries as well to both push for um, greater implementation, great, a faster, faster joining of the, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so that it would enter into force. And so that was the third big push of 2016 was to get enough countries to formally join the agreement so that it would kick into force. And, and when did so, that happen? Same time, early wow. October. It all happened yeah, at once. Which, which also happened, if I remember correctly, there was an election coming up in the United States. Was there? Yeah. And, um, and there actually turned out to be a change of control in the executive branch of the United States. Um, and then it obviously has come back four years later to the Democratic Party in control. But I'm just wondering, given the very different approaches that the two parties take to environmental issues generally, where do we stand today? Where, where, where does the Paris Accord stand today? I know that we had uh, the Trump administration had announced at some point that we were pulling out of it. Why, why don't we just focus on that one? Where sure. where is that? So, so President Trump early in his uh, first in his term uh, announced that he was going to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement. By the the nuances of the rules of that agreement, um, no country could formally withdraw until after. It had been enforced for three years, and then you had to announce you were withdrawing and wait a year before it went into effect. So the upshot of all that was that he did not actually formally pull the United States out of the Paris Agreement until November uh, 2020. And then President Biden had committed to bring us back into Paris on the first day of his administration. So we rejoined. Um, in January of 2021. So it was a very small window in which the U.S. wasn't a party. Okay. And do you know what's happening today uh, with climate change, international negotiations and treaties? I, My understanding is that there is uh, another phase of this that is going to be coming up sometime relatively soon. There's a lot going on, and as there should be, and there will continue to be. Um, but the but the way the Paris Agreement works is every country makes its own voluntary 
commitment to what it will do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's called its Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC. And the round of commitments that countries made when the Paris Agreement was first uh, put into effect were nowhere near adequate for what needs to be done to avoid really serious impacts of climate change. What we're now told by the global scientists is to be basically at carbon neutrality by mid-century, by 2050. So built into the Paris Agreement is every five years, countries are supposed to do a stock taking and come up with new commitments that um, the presumption is, though not the requirement, that they will be more stringent. And so there's an, an annual meeting of the parties to this agreement. And the next annual meeting of the parties is this November in Glasgow, Scotland. So the British are hosting it. And all the parties to the agreement are to come to Glasgow with new, stronger, nationally determined commitments. So a lot of the diplomacy this year is persuading countries to uh, take on greater commitments. And that is a significant uh, objective of the climate summit that President Biden held a few weeks ago, um, virtually, but where the US announced its new commitment, which is very ambitious, and several other countries came forward with stronger commitments. We're still waiting to hear from some others, but that's what's gonna be happening between now and November in particular. Um, How optimistic are you that we're going to be able to solve or at least significantly mitigate the climate change global warming problem? I'm optimistic because I don't think I have a choice. There's no alternative, um, but it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. I think on the positive side is that most of the technologies that we need to implement already exist. And so it's a matter of political will um, in many cases. The, and, a, and, a, and a need for decision makers to realize they have to take the long view and it will cost way more to take no action than to try to take action now. The costs down the road are horrible. Um, I'm also optimistic because of the full on commitment that the Biden administration is making to the problem and just seeing the summit and how countries are so welcoming that the US is back at the table. The US, um, plays an incredibly enormous, incredibly important role in these multilateral negotiations. And are, are we viewed as a leader again? I, I don't know if we have been consistently the last few years. Well, um, especially think, after we pulled out or announced the pullout. I think that they are, they want us to be a leader. They're welcoming us back as a leader, but they're probably still also, you know, by, you know, waiting to see what we do. Right. or waiting to see whether in four years we've switched again. Um, so, but I think we've moved from a point where, especially the major emerging economies were waiting just for the old emitters like the US and Europe to take action. We've gotten to a point where the, the, the problem has reached such a point where every, con every major country knows that they need to do something for their own self-interest. Um, and so, you know, they made some progress over the last four years without us, not as much as they would have with us, but they did make some. And then the third reason I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful is how seized by this issue young people are today. You know, they're passionate about it. They're rightly angry and scared. And, um, but they're also throwing their talent and their energy into solving the problem. You think more than more than we were when we were picking up litter on the first Earth Day in 1970? Um, yes. Yes, I think you know, so too. <laughs> I think so. You know, we were dealing yeah. with immediate problems, but they're dealing with an existential crisis. Yeah, yeah. It's their future. I mean, yeah. it's really the future of the planet and the future of the generations. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, just change gears as we wrap up here and. Um, 
I had mentioned earlier that you uh, a few years ago gave the commencement address at the College of Worcester. And one of the things um, in your address, which by the way, I've I've read it a couple of times. I think I may have seen you deliver it when you did. And uh, it was just an excellent uh, address to the graduating class from the college. One of the things you were encouraging some people in the graduating class to consider was a career in government. You know, it, we hear attacks on government all the time. Um, government is too big. Um, government doesn't accomplish anything. Ronald Reagan once said, um, you know, the I think it was Reagan who said the scariest words he ever heard were, um, I'm with the government and I'm here to help or something like that. I'm probably misquoting that. Um, do you know the quote, Jennifer? It's close. You're close. <laughs> but, but people drop off the last part. Um, so it, it was taken somewhat out of context, but people always use it to to sort yeah. of show how an attitude toward government as being not helpful. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. And and so there are a lot of people, obviously, in our country who think that government is too big. And, and, and yet you've spent much of your career in government doing a lot of very important work. And you urge young people to consider going into government to carry on either environmental work or working on other issues of importance. Um, why? Tell me what it is about government service that you find so compelling that you would encourage young people today to give serious consideration to careers in government. Well, I think that there, there are many ways that people can find careers of meaning and purpose, but there are so many ways that government is dedicated not only to improving the lives of its citizens, but also from my work internationally, very much the way that we can, you know, uh, deal with our own national security and protect our people by how we uh, position ourselves in the world, but also being a force for good, such as through these international climate negotiations. Um, but I, I think that I, I recommend people look hard at government careers whether it's your your city, your county, your state, or the federal or an international organization, because I think I think those entities have great responsibility, and to carry it out well, it needs great talent, and um, it's also just incredibly gratifying career that people that I've worked with at Justice, at State, at USTR, at EPA are very smart, dedicated people who get to work on really cool stuff. Um, but another reason I think I, I encourage people to think about, you know, really making a career of it is at least at the federal level, administrations come and go, political parties come and go. The career civil service is basically the buffer between wild swings in policy either direction. And it's the institutional memory and it's the expertise. And I think that's, that's at least for me, it's been a career of real meaning. Jennifer, this has been a great discussion. Um, I've always been inspired by you in different ways. And now, especially that I have a better understanding of your career and especially the work you've done in government, but also in academia and elsewhere. Um, what do you see as your, next act? Where do you go? I'm, I'm sure uh, I'm not trying to rush you out of Michigan. Maybe you'll spend the rest of your career there as far as I know. But what what other great thing do you want to accomplish before you call it a day? Well, well, Don, I know now from the beginning of this conversation and all the things that we've done the same, I think my next act is probably to do podcasts. <laughs> following in my footsteps. <laughs> following in your footsteps. If I follow you or you follow me. <laughs> well, maybe this will be a good start for you. And uh, and I'm sure if you ever do take up that um, task, you'll probably outperform me by far. Huh. Um, but uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I look forward to having a continued connection with you um, much beyond the next 
few months or years. Absolutely. I've just thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for asking me. Take care, Jennifer. You too, Don.